So this video is an introduction to pulse diagnosis. We're going to be talking about how to evaluate the pulse using the letters R, D, S, Q. And then we'll talk about the diagnostic information you can get from that. So if you're just starting out with pulse diagnosis, you're in the right place. And as always, this video is brought to you by people like you who support this channel. So to everyone who supports this channel, whether it's through joining the Patreon, hitting the super thanks button, or just liking this video and sharing it with your friends, thank you. So let's go ahead and talk about pulse diagnosis. So when I was a supervisor in the clinic, one thing I would ask students is, what skill would you like to work on? And the number one answer I would always get is pulse diagnosis. And it turns out when you want to learn how to take the pulse, the best way to do it is to take a lot of pulses. So say you take 10 pulses every day, you can take the weekends off. That means you're taking 50 pulses a week. That's like 200 pulses per month. And so after five months, you've taken over a thousand pulses. So hopefully if you've taken a thousand pulses and written them all down in your pulse log, in your pulse journal, Hopefully after that, you'll have learned something about how to take the pulse. But I think the problem here is, at least when I was starting out, when people tell me to take, take the pulse, I'd just be kind of like, I'm not entirely sure what I'm supposed to be feeling. I'm not sure what I'm feeling for. And sometimes it was difficult because a lot of my teachers were not very helpful with this. They'd say things like, oh, just sit and ask each of the officials, ask of the organs how they're doing, or reach out with your chi and see how the, the pulse is doing. And that just never made a whole lot of sense to me. So what we're gonna do here is talk about more of a systematic approach to evaluating the pulse. How can we do this in a systematic way where we're asking a series of questions to get some valuable information about what's going on in the pulse? And so the way I like to do this is using the letters R, D, S, Q. And so this stands for rate, depth, strength, and quality. So here what we're doing is we're basically going through and asking ourselves a series of questions. We put our fingers on the pulse and we first ask, what's the rate? Is it fast or is it slow? Then we ask, what's the depth? Is it superficial or is it deep? What's the strength? Is it strong and forceful or is it weak and forceless? And when we get to quality, we can say, what's the quality? We're really here asking about like which of the 28 pulse images apply. But if you're just starting out, chances are you don't know the 28 pulse images and they can be really confusing. So instead, we can just start asking ourselves some additional questions about the quality of the pulse. We can ask things like, what's the diameter of the vessel? Is, the dia is it very large or is it very narrow? Does the vessel have a hard, distinct edge? When you feel it, can you feel that edge on the vessel? And how is the blood flowing through the vessel? Is it flowing smoothly or is it flowing unsmoothly, roughly? And so here we can start, this is just a way that we can go through this list of questions. So when you put your fingers on the pulse, you're not like, I, don't, it, I guess it feels like a pulse. Instead, you can go through and start asking yourself these questions and actually get some really good information just through these simple questions. So let's go through each one one by one. We start with the rate. This is the first thing when you put your fingers on the pulse, we can ask ourselves, what's the rate? Is it fast or is it slow? And this is actually really easy to do because you just count the beats. Um, in the olden times, they counted the beats in accordance with their breath, the breath of the practitioner. So if, if you felt the pulse and it had four beats for every one of your breath or less, that meant it was a slow pulse. If you were counting the beats and it had five beats for, or more for every one of your breaths, that means the pulse was fast or rapid. Uh, so that was kind of the old way. Nowadays, most people have clocks and wristwatches, so we just say a slow pulse is anything less than 60 beats per minute, and a rapid pulse is anything greater than 90 beats per minute. So this is what you do. You put your fingers on the pulse and you ask, is it fast or is it slow? How do you know? You count the beats. If it's less than 60 beats per minute, you you're feeling a slow pulse. If it's greater than 90 beats per minute, you're feeling a rapid pulse. And so when you're first starting out, you probably just wanna count the beats with a clock. Maybe after you've taken 100 or 1,000 pulses, you'll start to have an idea of what constitutes 
slow and rapid. And so you can just kind of tell without counting that, oh, this feels pretty slow or, oh, this feels pretty fast. Or maybe it's neither. Maybe it's neither slow nor rapid. It's just normal and in between. But that's where we can start out with the rate. Is it slow or is it fast? Next, we can move on to the depth. We we're feeling, is it superficial or is it deep? Really what we're saying here is, do we feel the pulse on the surface or do we have to press in more to feel it deeper towards the bone? Or we can say, how much pressure is needed before you start to feel the pulse? Do you, can you feel the pulse with light pressure or do you need heavy pressure to in order to uh, feel the pulse? And so this is just ways of saying, is it superficial or is it deep? So if you feel the pulse near the surface and you feel it with light pressure, that's a superficial or a floating pulse. If you feel the pulse near the bone or you have to use heavy pressure in order to feel the pulse, that's a deep pulse. And again, this is something that when you're first starting out, you might not have a good reference point of what constitutes superficial and what constitutes deep. But as you take a lot of pulses, they'll start to give you an idea of, oh, this is really superficial versus, oh, this is really deep. But for now, you can just start by asking yourself, is, the, is it superficial or is it deep? Or how hard do I have to press in order to feel the pulse? And then after you take a lot of pulses, you start to calibrate uh, what these two things mean. I will say, I think one of the, the biggest mistakes people make when they first start taking the pulse is they automatically press too deep. They come in and they just clamp down really hard at the wrist on the pulse. Oh, one way it was described to me by a five element practitioner is he said, think about a butterfly landing on the surface of your skin. That's how light your touch should be at the start. So when you're starting off, just lay your fingers on the wrist like the way a butterfly would land on your hand and then slowly go in deeper until you can start to feel the pulse. And then you can just start to calibrate. Can I feel it? Do I just need to go in a little bit with very light pressure and I can feel the pulse? Or do I really have to sink in with really heavy pressure in order to feel the pulse? And that's how we can start to calibrate. Is it superficial or is it deep? So that's our second one. D is depth. Is it superficial or is it deep? After that, we get to strength. Is it strong or is it weak? And it turns out these terms might be a little, might be confusing when we talk about other pulse images. So instead of saying, is it strong or is it weak? It might be better to say, is it forceful or is it forceless? Does the pulse have force or not? And what we mean here is when we press into the pulse, how strongly is the pulse pushing back against our fingers? When the pulse, when we feel it against our fingers, is it pushing really hard, like poof, 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 uh, really strongly and forcefully, or is it pushing back on like, poof, poof, poof? is it very forceless or very weak? Maybe another way we can think about it is if you think about a waveform, a strong, uh, strong pulse or a forceful pulse has a waveform with a large amplitude. That would be a forceful pulse pushing against your fingers, whereas a forceless pulse would be like a waveform with a smaller amplitude. That would be more of a forceless pulse. So we talk about this. On the one hand, we could say that uh, we have these two words, uh, excess and deficient, or replete and vacuous. We could say deficient, uh, deficient pulse is forceless, it doesn't hit your fingers very hard, whereas an excess pulse is forceful. Now this is actually a little bit confusing when we, when we talk about the 28 pulse images. This can mean a couple different things. For some people, when you say deficient or excess, these are just general terms for a forceless or forceful pulse. Sometimes when we say deficient and excess, that means something more specific. So like a deficient pulse might describe a pulse that's forceless, floating and thin, but for now we can just say, we can maybe just stick to the terms forceless and forceful. When you feel the pulse, what's its strength? How hard is it pushing back against your fingers? Is it forceful or is it forceless? And again, this might take a while. This might be that when you're, you're first feeling pulses, you don't have a good gauge or a good calibration of what constitutes strong versus weak or forceful versus forceless. So this might be something where you have to take a couple hundred pulses to calibrate what constitutes forceful and what constitutes forceless. 
But when you're starting out, this is a question that you can start asking yourself very deliberately to sort of begin that process of calibration. When I take the pulse, what's its rate? Is it fast or is it slow? What's its depth? Do I feel it on the surface or closer to the bone? And what's its strength? Is it strong and forceful or weak and forceless? After that, we get into quality. And like we said, there are a, a lot of things we can say about quality. Technically, we could talk about the 27 or 28 or 29 pulse images. It changed throughout time, uh, depending on which book you're reading. But some of those pulse images can be very vague, very complicated. The descriptions are very poetic, like, oh, it feels like uh, pearls rolling on a plate. It feels like a knife scraping across bamboo. Uh, so maybe that can be a little bit complicated. So maybe if you're just starting out, you can start by asking, again, some, some simple questions. We can ask things like, what is the diameter of the vessel? So when we feel, when we put our fingers on the pulse, we're feeling that vessel, how, how wide is it beneath our, our fingers? Does it have a wide diameter, a big diameter, like a drinking straw? Or does it have a very small diameter? Is it narrow, like a piece of string, like, like a thread? And so when you look at that diameter, we can say, is it thin or is it large? Thin means it has a narrow, small diameter, whereas large means it's wide or has a large diameter. And so this is what we mean by the word thin and large. So when we say thin and narrow diameter, we can say thin or fine or thready. Those all mean the same thing. Those are all different translations of the, the pulse he mod. So we're basically, but we're asking what's the diameter of the vessel? And this was one that was really confusing to me when I was first starting out because a lot of times I'd be in clinic and people would be like, oh yeah, the pulse feels very thin. And for some reason back then, when I heard thin, I was thinking about the quality of the blood, like the viscosity of the blood, like like if a person was on blood thinners, then their blood was thin and watery versus uh, versus somebody who had thick blood, like it was thick and syrupy and felt like molasses. So initially when people said, oh yeah, this pulse is really thin, I thought that's what I thought they were talking about. It wasn't until much later when when I, I read a book about it that, it that I realized that the word thin is actually referring to the diameter of the vessel. And again, we have a couple ways this gets translated to English. We can say it's thin, it's fine, it's thread-like, or it's thready. Those all mean the same thing, and those are all referring to the diameter of the pulse. So another thing, another question we can ask ourselves about the quality of the pulse is, is there a hard edge to the vessel? Maybe hard edge isn't quite the, the right term. We can say, is there a distinct edge to the vessel? That when you're feeling this vessel, can you feel a distinct edge or is it just kind of soft and squishy and goopy? And so I've had, I mean, I've, I've had some patients where I feel I'm feeling for the pulse. And at first I thought I was feeling their tendon. I thought, oh, they have, their, their tendon is in a weird place. And only later, I, after a couple seconds, I realized, oh, that's their pulse. It's just, it's just that their pulse, the vessel was so uh, taut, so it had a, a, a distinct edge that it, it felt more like a tendon. Other people, you feel, the, you feel their pulse and you can't really tell a, a distinct edge. It's just kind of really soft and squishy. So if you start asking, can you feel that distinct edge? We're basically asking about, is the pulse wiry? Is it wiry or not? Turns out there's no word for not wiry. We just say either it's wiry or it's not. And so here we say a wiry means the, the vessel is like a zither string or it's crisp and it has crisp and distinct edges. And so uh, when we say zither, we're, we're referring to a class of stringed instruments. So in Chinese, they had the gu qin. This is a gu qin, a stringed instrument. They also had the gu zhang, which I'm not entirely sure what the difference is. I think a gu zhang is larger and it has more bridges in the middle. Anyway, basically when we say wiry, we're saying it's like a, a string, like a guitar string, something a wiry string like that, and that's what we're feeling. We're feeling this hardness or these distinct edges. So when we get to quality, that's another question we can ask ourselves is, do, do you feel this distinct edge to the vessel itself? Another one we can ask, and this is kind of weird, but how is the blood flowing through the vessel? Is it flowing very smoothly and very evenly, or is it flowing not smoothly? Is it, flowing, is it rough? Is it uneven? 
And so here we're actually, when we describe the flow, we can use these words slippery and choppy. So a slippery pulse is a smooth pulse. And when we say slippery, we're not talking about the quality of the vessel or the size of the vessel or the texture. We're talking about how is the blood flowing through that vessel? Is it flowing nice and smoothly? Versus a rough or choppy pulse would be not smooth. It would be rough. And so um, maybe if we wanted to draw it out, we could say that a slippery pulse is a very nice, smooth, comes and goes very evenly, whereas a choppy pulse is, is, is more erratic and it doesn't come and go as easily. And so that's what we're talking about when we're talking about how is the blood flowing through the vessel? Does it flow nice and smoothly or is it a little bit more erratic? We could say that another aspect of this like rough or choppy pulse is are the beats even? So with a with a smooth pulse, you expect the, the beats to be nice and even, whereas a choppy pulse, it might speed up and slow down. Sometimes it's three beats per breath, sometimes it's five beats per breath, and it, it doesn't have that even rate. That can also be an aspect of the choppy pulse. But you can start to think about, this is a little bit weird. It's a little bit subtle to feel, but you can start to think about as that pulse hits your fingers, as it goes up and down, how smoothly is it going up and down? How smoothly is it coming and going as it hits your fingers? And that's, that's what we talk about when we mean slippery versus choppy. And this might be one that you actually have to have someone demonstrate to you what it is. You might have to go in the clinic and find a very slippery pulse, find a, a pregnant patient and um, feel their pulse and be like, oh yes, that's very slippery. And just know that when you're feeling for that, you're feeling for how is the blood flowing through the vessel. So those are just some basic questions we can ask um, to get a sense of what the pulse is telling us. And so instead of just feeling like, what's what's going on here? What am I supposed to be feeling? Or even if you've been in the clinic in a while, some sometimes I get students that they go in there and they just immediately jump to, oh, the pulse feels soggy. It's like, well, maybe you can stop and go through, uh, start at the beginning, go through slowly and systematically, say, what is the rate? Is it fast or is it slow? What is the depth? Is it superficial or is it deep? What is the strength? Is it forceful or forceless? What is the quality as in, uh, what's the diameter of the vessel? Does it have a distinct edge? How is the blood flowing through? And so turns out actually asking these questions can give you a lot of information. And this is also useful because then when we go on to those 27 or 28 or 29 pulse images, it turns out when we start studying those, we actually already have a lot of information that we can apply to those 28 pulse images. So if you look at here, we have a, a chart of the 29 pulse images. And if we start to read into these, it turns out just by asking those simple questions, we've already covered a lot of these pulse images. So we have things like when we asked the rate, we were asking, is it fast or is it slow? Well, we have the slow pulse, the rapid pulse, and the racing pulse. And so just by asking what's the rate, we've already covered three of those 29 pulse images. Remember, slow is less than 60 beats per minute, rapid is greater than 90 beats per minute, and racing is like super rapid. It's greater than 120 beats per minute or seven or eight beats per practitioner breath. So we did rate, then we did depth. Is it superficial or is it deep? Well, it turns out we've already covered some of those. So superficial and floating means the same thing. It means I feel the pulse right on the surface. Deep means I have to push in deeper towards the bone. And then we have a, a hidden pulse and that just means very, very deep. So when we talk about depth, we've already covered three of the 29 pulse images. Uh, again, when we talk about strength, is it forceful or is it forceless? This maybe applies to these pulse images. Um, for some people, when we say deficient and excess, those are just general terms for uh, is it forceful or is it forceless? An excess pulse is a general term for a forceful pulse. A deficient pulse is a general term for a forceless pulse. But then in some books and some contexts, we're actually, we mean a little bit more than that. That when we say deficient, we don't just, just mean it's forceless. We mean it's forceless, floating, and fine or narrow in diameter. So 
That may or may not apply here, but that, that kind of gets you started in that direction. When you start asking about quality, we asked about the diameter of the vessel. And so that's two of our 29 is fine versus large. We have a thin pulse, a fine pulse, a thready pulse is referring to a narrow diameter of the vessel, whereas a large pulse is referring to a wide diameter of the vessel. When we start asking about quality, we get into things like how is the blood flowing? Is it slippery or is it choppy? Again, this is how smoothly is the blood flowing? If it's flowing nice and smoothly, that's a slippery pulse. If it's not flowing smoothly, then it's a rough or choppy pulse. And then, so when we, so basically when we went through that RDSQ, that actually covered almost half of the 29 pulses. So just by asking those simple questions, we've already gone a pretty far way into uh, learning our 29 pulse images and, and being able to know what's going on. But it turns out even after that, just by asking those questions, we can get some information on the other pulse images as well because a lot of these other pulse images are just combinations of those attributes that we already asked about. Here's what I mean. Um, let's talk about a soggy pulse. What is a soggy pulse? Does it mean that you poured too much milk on your cereal and now and that's what the pulse feels like? No, it turns out when we say a soggy pulse, rumi, that's just a combination of those other attributes we talked about. A soggy pulse is floating or superficial in depth, it's fine or thin in terms of diameter, and it's forceless in terms of its strength. So if you are taking the pulse and you say, you go through your RDSQ, you say, oh, the, the depth is, it's superficial, I feel it right on the surface. And the strength is, it's forceless, it's not, very, it's not pushing very hard against my fingers. And when I feel for the diameter, it feels very narrow in diameter. So then you could say, oh, this pulse is floating forceless and fine, or you could say this is a soggy pulse. When you feel those three things, you have felt a soggy pulse. We can go to the weak pulse. What do we mean by weak pulse? We don't. It turns out we don't just mean it's forceless. When we say weak, it's deep, fine, and forceless. So when we feel for the depth, oh, we have to push in with a lot of pressure and we feel the pulse near the bone. When we feel for the diameter, it's narrow or thin or fine in diameter. And when you ask about the strength, it's relatively forceless. If you feel a pulse that is deep, fine, and forceless, congratulations, you have felt a weak pulse. When we talk about a faint pulse, the faint pulse is very, very fine, very, very narrow, and very, very forceless. So if you feel, if you feel the pulse and the vessel is very, very narrow, such that you can almost hardly feel it, and the strength is very, very forceless, like you can almost not feel it pushing against your fingers, you felt a faint pulse. And then again, when we talked about the quality, uh, we talked about asking, can you feel a distinct edge in the pulse? Uh, is there a hard edge, a crisp edge? to that vessel. And it turns out that actually applies to two different pulse images, both a wiry pulse and a tight pulse. So it turns out a wiry pulse has a distinct edge, but it's also narrow in diameter. So it has that hard edge and it's a fine or thin pulse. Whereas a tight pulse is, it has that distinct edge, but it's very large in diameter. It has a, it's thicker. So one is, one is more like a, a thin guitar string, uh, maybe a, uh, what's the thinnest one? The E A D G, like an F string on your guitar. It's very thin, whereas the tight pulse is more like a rope that's been twisted up, and so it's a much thicker pulse, but it still has that hard, distinct edge. So it turns out just by asking this, this questions, going through systematically R D S Q, rate, depth, strength, and quality, that actually gets us most of the way in terms of these twenty nine pulse images. And so that's why I like to take this systematic approach when we take the pulse, instead of trying to come up with a poetic description of each of those pulse images, we can more clearly define it in terms of these attributes. And then this is just another way that we can uh, sort of organize it. This is a, a chart that comes from uh, uh, Secrets of Chinese Pulse Diagnosis by Bob Flaws. And so this is another way that we can organize these pulse images that 
uh, some of the pulses are floating pulses. When you feel it superficially, these are your options. It can be floating, scallion stock, drum skin, soggy, deficient, surging, scattered. Those are all floating pulses. We have deep pulses. The deep, hidden, confined, and weak pulse are all, by definition, deep pulses. And then we can talk about the rate that we have certain pulses that are, by definition, slow pulses, and by definition, rapid pulses. So again, by asking some of these simple questions about rate, depth, and strength, that can kind of help us organize uh, these 20, these kind of confusing 29 pulse images. So that's another way that this, this is helpful. And then I just want to talk about some of these pulse images because some of them are kind of confusing just because of translation issues. And so for example, when you talk about uh, the depth of the pulse, uh, the Chinese term is fu mai, that means fl uh, floating or superficial. And so these floating and superficial are just two words that are different translations of fu mai. So if somebody says floating and somebody says superficial, those mean the exact same thing. Both of those are words are referring to fu mai. So I have had that come up in, in classes where either our textbook uses different terms or sometimes I just tend to use them interchangeably, uh, superficial versus floating, and students will ask, wait, what's the difference between a superficial pulse and a floating pulse? It turns out they're the exact same thing, they're just different translations of the word fumai. And unfortunately, this is just a common thing that happens when we learn Chinese medicine in English. So another one is the thin pulse. Uh, in Chinese, this is shimai, so we can say thin, fine, or thready, or thread-like. So whenever you see any of these words, thin, fine, thready, they all mean the same thing, and they're all referring to the diameter of the vessel. And this one was kind of funny. I remember once being in school, and somebody asked one of the teachers, like, what's the difference between a thin pulse and a thready pulse? And so this teacher went on this, this long explanation. It was like 10 minutes, and you could tell she was kind of grasping, like she was maybe just making something up. And she went on this 10-minute uh, explanation about the subtle differences between a, th a thin pulse and a thready pulse. And it turns out there's no difference. These pulse images are the same. They're just different translations of the word shimai, and it's referring to the diameter of the vessel. So thin, fine, and thready we can use interchangeably. They, uh, they're all referring to a narrow diameter in the vessel. Another one, uh, hua mai slippery, we're talking about this smooth motion of the smooth flowing of blood through the vessel. We can say slippery or rolling. I feel like most people in the world use the word slippery, but when I took my California uh, licensing exam, they used the term rolling. And so that was something that I, I had to study and I had to get used to so that when I was looking at my case studies and it said it's a rolling pulse, I had to know in my mind, oh, they mean slippery. So these are, again, two translations of the word hua mai, which means a slippery or rolling pulse. The opposite of that is a uh, choppy, rough, or hesitant pulse, si mai, rough, choppy, or hesitant, and again, it's referring to how the blood is flowing through, but these are all different translations of the word si mai, so we can use these, uh, it can be used interchangeably, sometimes different books will say different things, sometimes, this is kind of an annoying thing about Bensky, when you get to the Bensky formulas book, sometimes he will use two different translations in the same chapter, that you'll have one formula that says, oh, this has a rough pulse, and then you'll flip to the next formula that says, this has a choppy pulse, and it's really confusing because you might think that those are two different things. It turns out they're just two different translations of the same Chinese word, and I'm assuming that just that book had several authors, so different, different authors use different translations. But really, uh, rough, choppy, or hesitant is one that I don't see as often, but you might see come up. These are all different translations of si mai, and it's referring to how smoothly the pulse is going through the vessel. So now that we've kind of talked about what we're trying, what we're feeling for beneath our fingers, uh, when we put our when we put our fingers on the pulse, what questions can we ask? What are we feeling for? We can now go on to when we feel those things. What does that mean diagnostically? And the, again, this can give us, um, even though we're asking very simple questions, this can give us a lot of good information about what's going on diagnostically. So let's talk about that. Remember, we started with a uh, rate, RDSQ, the R means rate. We're asking, is it fast or is it slow? And basically, when we, 
when we determine is it fast or is it slow, this is telling us about the presence of heat or cold in the body. So think about like just in physics, uh, heat causes things to speed up and cold causes things to slow down. Well, the same thing is true in the body that when there's heat that causes the heart rate to speed up, that causes the blood to speed up. When there's cold, cold is a yin pathogen. It causes things to slow down. So the pulse slows down, the blood moving through the vessel slows down. So when we ask, is it fast or is it slow? A slow pulse means there's some sort of cold in the body or cold condition. Whereas a rapid pulse means there's some kind of heat in the body. Now, the thing to be careful here is the rate of the pulse is just telling us temperature. Is it hot or is it cold? It's not telling us, for example, what kind of heat is there? Is it excess heat or is it deficiency heat? We don't really know. Where is the heat coming from? Is it uh, heart heat? Is it stomach fire? Is it heat due to liver and kidney yin deficiency? We don't know. When we ask about the rate, we're just asking, we just are getting information about is it hot or is it cold? If we want to know what kind of heat and where is it coming from, we have to investigate further with other signs and symptoms. When we talk about depth, we are asking, is it superficial or is it deep? Do we feel the pulse on the surface or are we pushing in closer to the bone? And basically the depth of the pulse can tell us about the depth of the pathogen or the depth of the disease. So for a superficial pulse, that's a sign of an exterior pattern. With a deep pulse, that's a sign of an interior pattern. So basically, if you feel the pulse on the surface, that means that there's a condition on the surface. If you feel the pulse deeper in, that means you're feeling a, a condition that is deeper in the body. And so it turns out this, this, this is mostly true. There are some exceptions to this where I think in certain patterns of yin deficiency, where when the yin is deficient, the yang will float upwards and outwards. And so it's possible that you'll be feeling a floating pulse because of yin deficiency. But generally, in a very basic beginner way, we can think that the depth of the pulse tells you the depth of the condition or the depth of the pathogen. If you feel it on the surface, you're feeling a surface condition. If you're feeling it deeper in the body, you're feeling a, 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 an interior condition. So depth. Strength, is it forceful or is it forceless? When we uh, put our fingers on the pulse, how strongly is the pulse pushing back against our fingers? Well, the strength of the pulse is gonna tell us the, the, the strength of either the strength of the pathogen or the strength of the right chi. So a forceful pulse tells us there's a, an excess condition and a forceless pulse tells us it's a deficiency condition. And so again, strength of the pulse, strength of the pathogen. And so then, maybe you can see where we're going with this is we can kind of combine these together. So if I feel a pulse that's floating, rapid, and forceful, well, if it's floating, it's on the exterior. If it's rapid, it's heat. If it's uh, forceful, it's excess. That's an excess exterior heat condition. So we can kind of, we can actually take these different things and combine them together and they should make sense. So when you talk about strength, is it forceful or forceless? That can tell us about excess versus deficiency. And maybe if you're, if you're thinking ahead and if you've learned this in uh, your fundamentals class, you can, you can think that if you've learned about eight principal diagnosis, maybe you're starting to see how these two things connect together. So remember in fundamentals, when you talk about eight principal diagnosis, this is a very basic diagnostic frame where when we get a patient, we're asking ourselves a series of questions. Is it hot or is it cold? Is it exterior or is it interior? Is it excess or is it deficient? And is it yang or is it yin? Well, hopefully you can guess by now that we can get a lot of this information just by asking those basic questions about the pulse. So when we do our eight principle diagnosis, is it hot or is it cold? The way we determine that is by the rate. If the pulse is rapid, that's a heat condition. If the pulse is slow, that's a cold condition. Is it exterior or interior? Well, we can get that from the depth of the pulse, that in exterior condition, in an external tack of wind cold, uh, heat on the exterior, those are exterior conditions, and we feel that with a superficial pulse. Is it excess or is it deficient? That's uh, determined by the strength of the pulse. So if we feel a very forceful pulse, that's an excess condition. If we feel a weak pulse or a forceless pulse, that's a deficient condition. So this is something that can be very useful to you in the clinic. 
This is also can be very useful to you when you're taking a test and you have case studies. You can go and look at the pulse and you can ask those, you can look for those same qualities about is the pulse rapid or slow? Is it forceful or forceless? Is it superficial or is it deep? And that can help you with your eight principal diagnosis. And then you can kind of use a process of elimination if you're doing like Zong Fu patterns. Um, if it's a if it's an excess heat condition, you could probably rule out yang to uh, spleen yang deficiency or something like that. You can actually use this on your case studies and in the clinic. When we talk about the quality, we were asking those questions about like what's the diameter of the vessel? Is there a distinct edge? Um, how's the blood flowing? It turns out these things are not quite as straightforward diagnostically. So I think it's good to start asking these questions to sensitize your fingers. But in terms of diagnostic information, it's a little bit more complicated because there can be several things that are going on that can cause the pulse to feel a certain way. So some of them are straightforward and some of them are not. So when you ask about what's the diameter of the vessel, we are asking, is it a wide diameter or a narrow diameter? Uh, basically we said, is the pulse thin or fine or thready or is it large? Well, with a thin pulse, when that diameter is small, basically what's happening is there's not enough stuff to fill the vessel. Because there's not enough substance filling the vessel, the vessel shrinks and it starts to feel thin or fine or thready. And so usually when we say there's not enough stuff, either there's not enough blood filling the vessel or there's not enough yin substance or yin fluids filling the vessel to give the vessel its proper diameter. So if you, if you feel the pulse and it's thin in diameter, you know there's, there's not enough substance filling the vessel, but that could be blood or that could be yin. When you feel a large pulse, uh, there's actually a couple possibilities here, and so it can get kind of confusing. It could be that a, a large pulse means you have too much stuff filling the, st filling the vessel. You have excess dampness, excess phlegm, uh, stagnant blood filling up the vessel, and that's why it feels large. But again, we can also sometimes have cases where, like, if there's deficiency, things start to lose their root and they start to float upward and outward. So sometimes with certain cases of, say, like yin deficiency or, or other types of qi deficiency, other types of deficiency, that can actually cause the, the, the vessel to expand in diameter. And so it will feel large, but then when you push into it, there's nothing there. And so just the large diameter by itself doesn't really tell you a whole lot. We have to look at other things. And so that's why at large, when you talk about the, the 27 versus 28 versus 29 pulse images, large is not usually included in the 27. If you expand to 29, then they'll say a DAMI, a large pulse. But it turns out the large pulse isn't, isn't really great as a distinctive pulse image because it can mean a couple different things. But it's still something that's good to look at when you're uh, feeling for the pulse. What's the diameter of the vessel? Is it wide or is it narrow? Then we talked about, is there a hard edge to the vessel? Is there a distinct crisp edge? It is like, is it soft and squishy where you can't really feel anything? Or is there definitely a distinct edge to that vessel? And then, like we said, there are actually two qualities that are like this. We have the wiry pulse and the tight pulse. And the difference is a wiry pulse has a hard edge, but it's narrow in diameter. It's a thin pulse. Whereas a tight pulse has a hard edge, but it's, um, large in diameter. It's a, it's a wide vessel. <clears throat> but again, these can mean a couple different things, or I guess really what we could say, what it means is this is a sign that of uh, constraint, that things are not flowing smoothly. So if you feel this hard edge, it means that things are not flowing smoothly. But the reason why things are not flowing smoothly it turns out there's a couple di couple possibilities. It could so we could say it's liver patterns. It, the the liver is responsible for governing free coursing. So if the liver is not free coursing, you have liver chi stagnation. That could be a wiry pulse. But maybe the reason the liver isn't uh, free coursing the chi is because the liver is deficient. And so it could be that liver deficiency is causing the pulse to be wiry. Liver chi, uh, liver blood deficiency, liver yin deficiency is causing the pulse to be wiry. Or it could be that you don't have enough chi, you don't have enough uh, uh, mode of chi, and you don't have enough moving the chi through it. You have a weak spleen, and that's why that's why there's constraint and things are not moving. That's why you feel it. Or it could be that you have a pain condition. Pain causes things to tense up, and that's why the pulse feels wiry. 
Or it could be that there's some other obstruction. Maybe there's phlegm or dampness that's making it so the chi can't flow smoothly, and that's why the pulse feels wiry. In terms of a tight pulse, it could be that there's cold obstructing the free the free flowing of chi, and that's why it feels you feel this hard edge. It feels tight or wiry. So basically, when you feel this hard edge, it means there's some sort of constraint. But we don't necessarily know where that constraint is coming from, so we would have to ask additional questions and we have to line it up with our other signs and symptoms that we can, we can say, oh, do I feel an edge to the vessel? Yes, I feel an edge to the vessel. That means there's some sort of constraint. Well, then we have to ask the, the follow-up question, what is causing that constraint? So wiry, it's, it's not quite as straightforward as fast versus slow. And then how is the blood flowing through the vessel? Here again, we said slippery versus choppy. And again, each of these, since we're just describing how the blood is flowing, they can mean a couple different things. So when we say slippery, the, the blood is flowing very smoothly through the vessel. What's causing the blood to flow smoothly? Well, it could be just the person is a normal, healthy person, and that's how your blood is supposed to flow. So it could just be slippery means you're healthy. It could also mean that the blood is flowing smoothly because there's heat. Heat causes things to speed up, and because it speeds up, it tends to go a little bit more smoothly. It has this, the heat causes this, this nice swirling movement of blood through the vessel, so maybe slippery means there's heat. It could mean there's a phlegm dampness or food stagnation, that some of the, these excesses result in a, a very smooth, it's like the blood is riding along on this wave of dampness, it makes it really smooth. Pregnancy tends to result in a slippery pulse. So again, when we're, we're asking, how's the blood flowing? You say, oh, the blood is flowing smoothly. That could actually mean several different things. And same thing with choppy, when we say rough or choppy, we're basically saying the blood is not flowing smoothly. Well, if the blood is not flowing smoothly, there are a couple possibilities. It could be that the blood is not flowing because there's not enough chi to move the blood smoothly. So there could be chi deficiency. It could be the blood isn't flowing smoothly because there's not enough blood to flow smoothly. That, that's, there's blood deficiency. It could be that there's some blood stasis or liver chi stagnation. Something's causing the blood not to flow smoothly, and that's why we feel a rough or a choppy pulse. So again, these qualities aren't quite as straightforward. Um, if you start to feel these things, you might have to ask certain more follow-up questions about why are these things happening. But I think at least when you're starting out and you're beginning to sensitize your fingers to the pulse, it's still a good idea to ask these questions that as you're going through, rate, depth, strength are pretty straightforward. Rate, you just count the beats. Uh, depth, is it superficial or is it deep? You might have trouble in the beginning. You'll have to calibrate by feeling 100 pulses. Um, strength, same thing. Is it forceful or forceless? You might have to take 100 pulses, but you can ask how how is the pulse pushing against your fingers? And then you can start to ask about these qualities um, and just maybe know that for now, it might the diagnostic information isn't going to be quite as straightforward. You should still ask yourself those questions so you have an idea of what's going on, but just the diagnosis isn't going to be quite as straightforward. And so that's why I go back to, there's this quote from Judan Shi where he says, the diseases in human beings fall into four categories, known as cold, heat, repletion, and vacuity. Therefore, the student of pulse should take the floating, deep, slow, and rapid pulses as the reins in observing disease conditions. This is an unchanging principle. So here, what we're basically saying is we can go back to these basics. Even though we have these 27 or 29 pulse images that have very poetic descriptions, we can still go back to these basics about rate, depth, and strength and gain a lot of diagnostic information. So if you're a beginner just starting out, I would say this is a good place to start is by taking Judan Shi's example of talking about floating deep, slow, and rapid. If anything, I would just, uh, I would modify this slightly because he talks about excess versus deficiency and uh, slow versus rapid, where I, I think like what we said, that might have to do more with the strength. So. I might modify Judanchi and say we should look at the rate, depth, and strength, and that will give us very basic information about heat versus cold, 
uh, exterior versus interior and excess versus deficiency. So that's a very basic place you can start. And again, this can actually take you a very long way in terms of diagnosis, whether you're diagnosing a patient in the clinic or whether you're dealing with a case study on a test, asking those simple questions can really help you with that. And then finally, just because we're talking about pulse, I'll briefly mention the positions. We have the three positions, the, the, the tsun, the guan, and the chur, the three positions of the pulse. And basically, this is something, this is maybe a little bit more advanced thing that you can get into. Just, basically what I'm trying to say is there's really, there's not a big consensus on it. This is one interpretation of these three positions. It turns out different uh, different books will say different things. Different styles of acupuncture will interpret these three positions differently. So, for example, originally in the Nanjing, it looked kind of like this, but it was talking specifically about the channels. So they didn't say lung and large intestine. They said hand tai yin and hand yang ming, because when you're feeling the pulse, you are feeling the state of the qi in the channels. And then other people came along and said, no, we can actually feel stuff in the organs. So when we say lung, large intestine, we mean the organs in the, in the Mai Jing. In the, in the Ben Hu Mai Jing, it was saying more that, no, it's not really specific to that. It's more uh, about the, the three burner. So that the Tsun position, you're feeling things in the upper body, in the upper burner from the diaphragm upward. In the Guan position, you're feeling the middle jowl, so things from the diaphragm to the umbilicus. And in the Chur position, you're feeling things in the lower jowl from the, um, the umbilicus downward. And so some people look at it like that. I had some people in school that it was basically like this, except for their chur position, they didn't look at pericardium and sanjiao. They said one is kidney yin and one is kidney yang. So that's another way to look at it, that the right rear position tells you about kidney yang and the left rear position tells you about kidney yin. So there are, there are a lot of different ways that you can interpret this. And I think kind of they're all true and we should keep that in mind. So, so, um, Bob Flaws gives the example of if you're if you if the pulse feels wiry in the tsun position, well maybe you're feeling something in the lung because that's associated with the lung. Or maybe you're just feeling something in the upper body. Maybe it's a headache because the head, head is in the upper jaw and that's an upper jaw condition. So maybe that wiry tsun position is actually a headache. Maybe it's shoulder pain. We don't really know. We have to investigate a little bit deeper. So when we talk about these positions, it's really going to depend, and it's going to depend a lot on your style, that the way J.R. Worsley five element people look at the pulse might be slightly different than the way uh, Japanese style practitioners, Ikeda style practitioners look at the pulse. So this is probably going to depend on uh, your school and your system. But if you're a beginner, if you're just starting out in the clinic and you're starting to take the pulse and you want to know something about these three positions, I think maybe a good place to start is just ask yourself, of these positions, which one is the strongest and which one is the weakest? And again, so you're just starting to sensitize your fingers. And so if you, if you feel like, oh, this guy's pulse, it's, it's really forceful and wiry and hard in the guan position, that's good information. And then you can start to ask things further of when I feel that, does that mean he has a liver condition or does that mean something else? That there's something else going on in the middle jowl. So it can start to, it can give you a starting place at least of where to look. And then you can maybe get more specific depending on your specific style or teacher or school. And so with uh, positions, it's, it's again, a little bit more complicated. So maybe if you're starting out, you can just start with which of these three positions on each side which one is the strongest and which one is the weakest. And I would do that after you go through your uh, questions about the pulse as a whole. This is another thing where I think that I see a lot of students and they take the pulse and they immediately say, oh, it's really wiry in the liver position or like, oh, it's really deep and weak in the kidney position. And they jump to that and they forgot to go through what does the pulse feel like overall? What, it is, what is its rate? What is its depth? What is its strength? So I would start with the pulse overall, what are those qualities? And then after that, when you get a general overall idea of is it hot or is it cold? Is it excess or is it deficient? Is it uh, interior or exterior? After you ask those questions, then you can go into the individual positions about uh, what's going on in the three jowl, what's going on in the individual channels or organs and uh, do that as their next step. 
So that is pulse diagnosis. Again, the sources we used for that, for this, are uh, The Secrets of Pulse Diagnosis by Bob Flaws. The Secret of Chinese Pulse Diagnosis by Bob Flaws was one source. And Li Shijun's Pulse Studies, an illustrated guide by Li Shenqing and William Morris was another source. So if you want to learn more, these are very good books to get. That um, I think the Bob Flaws book, I really like his descriptions of all the pulses in here, but it's it's just text. It's a little it's a little bit drier, but it does have really good uh, descriptions. Uh, Li Shijun, it's like the the information is basically the same. But what's nice about this one is it has pictures. So if you're more if you want to visualize uh, the pulse in terms of waveforms. This can be a good book to get, so I'll put uh, links to each one below. And I think with both of these, I have older editions. So I think this is the the second edition. If you go on Amazon, they have a third edition out, and this is a first edition. If you go on Amazon, they have a second edition that's a hardcover book. So I think these are um, these are good. And the other difference is the price. Is I think this one. Mine says twenty four ninety five on the back. I think the third edition was selling for like thirty dollars, whereas this one, the hardcover version on Amazon, was selling I think for like seventy dollars. So it's a little, it's a bit more, but I think if you're serious about pulse diagnosis, if you're one of those people that you want to go get very detailed about the twenty nine pulse images, and you really want to uh, be able to use those diagnostically, then it might be worth that money to get. Um, something like Li Shijun's Pulse Study. So this is another book that I like that I recommend. But even if you're not uh, you're not interested in these books or you don't want to get that detailed in the 29 pulse images yet, I think it's, it's still a good starting point to start with RDSQ, Rate, Depth, Strength, and Quality. Whenever you feel a pulse, start by asking these questions. What's the rate? Is it fast or slow? What's the depth? Is it superficial or is it deep? What's the strength? Is it forceful or is it forceless? And then you can get into more subtle questions about what's the diameter of a vessel? Is there an edge to the vessel? How smoothly is the blood flowing? Even if you um, aren't ready to start memorizing the word-for-word -word definition of each of the 29 pulse images. If you're not ready for that, this is a good starting place where you can start to get some good information. So that is our introduction to pulse diagnosis. Again, uh, thank you to everybody who supports the website and the channel. So if you got value out of this video and you want to give something back, there are several ways to do it. You can join the Patreon. That's like a monthly subscription. It's a monthly donation. And it, it comes with a, a few little extras. I've been trying to write some blog entries on that Patreon feed. If you want to just do a one-time donation, you can do it below this video with the super thanks button or the buy me a coffee. Also, anyone who buys, if you buy the courses, buy the merchandise, I have t-shirts and, and mugs, uh, that helps support the channel. But I know that a lot of people are students and they don't have a lot of extra funds. So just if you like the video or share it with your friends, that also helps us, helps out a lot. So uh, thank you um, to everyone who supports us and we'll see you in the next one.